In the heart of Victorian London, a shadowy killer stalks the streets, leaving a city gripped by fear. Secrets and clues entwine as the hunt for a true face of evil begins. Welcome ladies and gentlemen to a world shrouded in mystery and intrigue. Prepare yourself as we explore the chilling tale of one of the most infamous serial killers in history. The enigmatic serial killer who terrorized the streets of Whitechapel in the late 19th century. This is the story of Jack the Ripper. Whitechapel is regarded as London's most renowned criminal hangout in the late Victorian era. According to Assistant Police Commissioner Robert Anderson, Whitechapel is identified as one of London's top criminal showplaces, and anyone interested in visiting was advised to be aware of the dangers that lurk in the streets of this city. Whitechapel was plagued with different kinds of crime. Theft, violence, and alcoholism were all too common. Extreme poverty, poor housing, inadequate sanitation, homelessness, intoxication, and prostitution, just to name a few. Just to give some insight on the living situation in Whitechapel, they had 233 lodging houses where nearly 8,500 people laid their head to rest each night. The Whitechapel murders, a collection of 11 fatalities that occurred in Whitechapel between 1888 and 1891, were included in the police docket as one single incident. Much of the original content was either stolen, misplaced, or destroyed. Let's talk about the first victim of the Ripper, Emma Elizabeth Smith. While only a little was known about Emma before the occurrence in 1888, we do have some points that can give you some insight on her life though. Emily was seen as an unfortunate. This is what people in Whitechapel called the lowest class of prostitutes. These women were known to perform acts in pretty much any location. This is important for context. The deputy keeper of the lodging house, Mary Russell, later recalled Emma often coming home with black eyes that men had given her. Even on one occasion, Emma told Mary that she was thrown out of a window. Like many of the unfortunates, alcoholism was the primary culprit for Emma's undoing. Reports say that Emma acted like a mad woman when she had a drink. Detective Walter Dew later wrote that Elizabeth's past was a closed book, even to her intimate friends. One thing that is known about Emma's past is over 10 years prior, Emma left her husband and disassociated herself from all of her previous connections. What many thought to be strange is Emma had a cultured tone with her speech. They thought she might have come from a family with some money or had some herself in the past. Unfortunates rarely spoke in a cultured manner. Emma stated that the reason she broke away from her old life is that people around her wouldn't understand any more now than they understood about her back then. She said, I must live somehow. One last point that should be made about Emma is she was known to be lonely, even more so than others in her class. It is hard to understand why Emma chose this lifestyle over her past. Was it better in her mind? We will never know. As per the police records, on April 3rd, 1888, Emma Elizabeth Smith, a 45-year-old prostitute, was beaten and robbed near Osborne Street and Brick Lane in Whitechapel. Despite being hurt, she managed to escape and return back to the lodge that she lived in. After escaping the brutal attack, she reported to the deputy officer that two or three males had attacked her. She further explained to deputy officer Mary Russell that she believed one of her attackers was a teenager. Russell, after hearing this, transported Emma to the London hospital where a physical examination indicated that she had her peritoneum ruptured after being assaulted by a blunt object. The following morning at 9 a.m. she passed away after contracting peritonitis. Edmund Reed of the H Division in Whitechapel, a local inspector for the Metropolitan Police, looked into the attack, but no one was ever found responsible. Later, Detective Constable Walter Dew was assigned to the H Division. Not long after, he claimed that Emma was the first victim of Jack the Ripper, but his co-worker thought a criminal gang was responsible for her slaying. Based on Emma's own testimony, I personally feel that she wasn't the first victim. Jack was known to work alone, so why would she say it was a group if it was only one culprit? There is a theory that many people believe which states that Emma's attackers may have tried to intimidate or punish her for defying them, and she may not have named the assailants out of fear of retaliation. The second believed victim of Jack the Ripper is Martha Tabram. But who is Martha Tabram? Martha, who many believe to be the first victim of Jack the Ripper, was born in Southwark, London on May 10th, 
1849. Martha, who was 5 foot 3 inches tall and had dark hair, was the youngest of five children. Her parents were Charles Samuel White, a warehouseman, and his wife, Elizabeth Dowsett. It was six months after the separation of Martha's parents in May 1865 that her father died of natural causes at the age of 59. On Christmas Day in 1869, Martha married a foreman furniture packer, Henry Samuel Tabram. This marriage was troubled due to Martha's heavy drinking, and her husband left her in 1875, just six years after they were married. Martha lived on and off with a man named Henry Turner, a carpenter, from about 1876 until three weeks before her death. Martha's economic situation had become so desperate that she felt forced into the sex trade. At 2.30 a.m. on Tuesday, August 7, 1888, Martha was deceased. Just before 5 a.m., her body was discovered at the George Yard buildings in Whitechapel. She had been stabbed 39 times with a short blade in the neck, torso, and private area. They believed her wounds were caused by a person who was right-handed. So let's go back a little bit and talk about what reportedly happened the night before her brutal slaying. Martha apparently went out drinking with a fellow prostitute by the name of Mary Ann Connolly. She went by the name The Pearly Pole, a person none of her fellow prostitutes have heard of. By a weird coincidence, Martha told Mary that her name was Emma, not Martha. Mary's recollection of the events in question were not consistent. One version is she met with Martha at 11 p.m. at a pub and drank until 11.45, in another version, they started drinking at 10 p.m. and went pub hopping. Later that night, around 11 p.m., Martha's sister-in-law, Ann Morris, says she spotted Martha on her own. With all the conflicting timelines, it was hard for police to narrow down where Martha was at a given time. It was possible that Martha met Mary at the White Swan and they remained there or even visited other pubs in the area. Later that night, according to Conley, they met two soldiers, a corporal and a private. The two men bought them drinks which the ladies were happily obliging. Mary said around midnight all four left the pub and headed off along Whitechapel Hill Street where at that point they split into pairs at the entrance of George Yard. Connolly and her soldier made their way to the nearest alley. Martha and her soldier went into Georgia Yard which is now known as Gunthrop Street. At 1.40 a.m., Joseph and Elizabeth Mahoney, who lived at 37 George Yard buildings, returned home after spending the bank holiday with some friends. Elizabeth headed out to buy some supper from a place called Chandler's Shop in the nearby Thrall Street. She returned about five minutes later. This is important because she would have passed the spot where Martha's body was found and didn't notice it. The only thing that Elizabeth said is that it was too dark and she may have passed the body without even noticing it. Around 2 a.m., police constable Thomas Barrett spotted a soldier loitering near the entrance of George Yard. The constable told the soldier that it was time he returned to his barracks, but the soldier stated that he was waiting on a fellow soldier who accompanied a woman to a nearby building. The constable didn't seem to push the issue any further and went on his way. Martha's body was first noticed by Alfred Crow, a cab driver who was returning home to the George Yard buildings. As he was walking up the stair to his building, he noticed that someone was lying on the first floor landing. He didn't think much of it as people were often found sleeping on the landings. He wasn't even sure that the person laying there was either a man or a woman. Near 4.45 in the morning, John Saunders Rees was headed to his job as a waterside laborer. As he descended the stairs from the top floor, he noticed someone laying there in the landing. He noticed that a woman was laying on her back in a pool of blood. He rushed to find a policeman in the area and found Constable Barnett, who previously saw the soldier loitering. The constable sent John Reeves to fetch the local medic, Dr. Timothy Colleen, and the doctor examined the lady and pronounced her dead on the spot. His conclusion was that she was viciously murdered. One major difference from Martha's case to Emma's case is that the doctor ruled out a sexual motive and that she had not had intercourse recently. A huge change in motive from the first murder to the second. On August 7th, they tried identifying the soldier that the constable met at George Yard. They brought several soldiers to meet Constable Barrett, but he couldn't identify any of them as the person he saw that night. The next day, the guards who were on leave that night in question were brought before the constable. He identified two men out of the lineup as possibly the person he saw. The first of the two he realized quickly he was wrong about and they let leave, but the second man who identified himself as John Leary was able to give complete detail of his movements on the night in question. His accounts then were backed by fellow soldier John Law. This made law enforcement think he was no longer a suspect. The next day when police met with Mary Ann Conley who showed up on her own at the police station, Police put a ton of faith into Mary's account of what happened. Mary said she later remembered that the soldiers had white bands around their cap. This meant that they were part of the Coldstream Guards. 
Inspector Reed organized what they called an identity parade at the barracks. Mary claimed she saw one of the soldiers that they met that night. She was asked, are you positive? And Mary said, certainly. The military handed over the books that showed what time the men left and returned the barracks that night. It was also noted that the corporal, who was actually a private, had good conduct stripes and was a man of exemplary character. He was back at the barracks at 10 p.m. that night. After exonerating the private, he was told it was clearly a case of mistaken identity. The police were disgusted by Mary, aka the Pearly Pole. The South Wales Echo printed an article on August 20th, 1888, showing the frustration of the police. I will read the article word for word for you. Pearly Pole is a dangerous person to trust to. She bamboozled the police into the idea that she could give them a clue to the Whitechapel murder. It was done by a corporal and a private in the Grenadier Guards at the Tower on Bank Holiday. While the soldiers were paraded, Pole picked out the men, but her corporal was a private with two good conduct stripes on his arm and spotless character and an irrefragable alibi. The other man was shown to be equally innocent so that the police had been fooled this whole time following up false clues. It is always dangerous to trust for identification to the evidence of an ignorant, excitable woman of Pearly Pole's class. In fact, her testimony, at best, is never a pearl of great price. Pretty brutal stuff, but well warranted. I can only imagine how many times police have to go through this in an investigation. It makes things nearly impossible and greatly slows down the progress. Later, William Turner, the carpenter she lived with on and off, learned about the murder and got in touch with police. William also let the police know she was still married to her husband, Henry Tabram, even after all these years. This is when the newspaper started publishing her correct name. Walter Dew later wrote in his autobiography, Whatever may be said about the death of Emma Smith, there can be no doubt at the August Bank holiday murder, which took place in the George Yard buildings, was the handiwork of the Dread Ripper. From here on out, we're not going to go in depth into the lives of the victims, as most of them have similar lifestyles loving alcohol and prostitution being the main two connections. Now let's talk about the third victim, Mary Ann Nichols. Mary Ann Nichols was murdered Friday, August 31st in Bucks Row, a side lane in Whitechapel that has since been renamed Deward Lane. Charles Cross, a cart driver, found her body on the ground in front of the guarded stable entry at 3.45 in the morning. Mary was stabbed in her stomach, waist, and side. Her throat was also slashed twice. Because the murder occurred in the region of the Bethnal Green Division, it was initially investigated by local detectives. On the same day, James Monroe resigned as the head of the Criminal Investigation Department due to disagreements with Sir Charles Warren, Chief Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. Initial investigations into the murder were unsuccessful, even though portions of the press linked it to the two prior killings and speculated that the murder might have been carried out by a gang, as in the case of Smith. Instead, the Star newspaper stated that a single murderer was to blame, and other media started picking up on that narrative. Suspicions of a serial killer on the loose in London led to the second met of Scotland Yard's Central Office Detective Inspectors, Frederick Alberline, Henry Moore, and Walter Andrews. According to the coroner, they concluded that Nichols was murdered shortly after 3 a.m., right before she was discovered. In his conclusion, he disregarded the notion that her murder was linked to those of Smith and Tabram, since the lethal weapons used in those incidents differed, and neither of those previous cases had slashed to the throat. However, by the time the inquest into Nichols' death was completed, a fourth woman has been murdered. And it was at this time Baxter stated, the similarity of the two injuries in the cases is significant. Which leads us to our next victim. Mrs. Annie Chapman. Annie Chapman's mangled body was discovered on the ground outside a doorway in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street, Spitalfields, at 6 a.m. on Saturday, September 8. Chapman had left her accommodations at 2 a.m. on the day she was murdered, intending to collect rent money from a customer, but she was found with her throat slashed from the left to the right, just like Nichols. Other gruesome injuries were also suffered at the hands of the murderer. 
and the most chilling part found by the autopsy was a portion of her uterus was removed. George Baxter Phillips, a pathologist, believed that the murderer must have had anatomical knowledge to have hacked off the reproductive organs in a single motion with a blade around 6 to 8 inches long. Other specialists, however, disputed the suggestion that the murderer was a skilled surgeon. Because the bodies were not thoroughly investigated at the scene, it has also been suggested that the organs were removed by mortuary personnel to sell as surgical specimens. On September 10th, police apprehended a notorious local named John Pizer, dubbed Leather Apron, known for terrorizing local prostitutes. His alibis for the last two murders were verified, and he was freed without charge. Mrs. Elizabeth Long, one of the witnesses at the inquest, said that she saw Chapman chatting to a guy around 5.30 a.m. just beyond the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street, where Chapman was later located. And then, Detective Baxter deduced that the man Mrs. Long saw was the murderer. Mrs. Long described him as over 40 years old, a little taller than Chapman, with a dark complexion and a foreign, shabby, genteel appearance. He was dressed in a dark overcoat and a brown deerstalker hat. Around the same time, another witness, Albert Kadosh, entered the neighboring yard at 27 Hansbury Street and heard voices. Then he heard the sound of something or someone collapsing against the fence. According to Walter Dew's memoirs, the death sparked widespread alarm throughout London. A mob attacked the Commercial Road police station believing that there was a murderer being detained. After accusations that the attacks were Jewish ritual killings, anti-Semitic riots broke out. Samuel Montagu, a Jewish member of parliament for Whitechapel, announced a £100 reward for the capture of the Ripper. This would approximately be £12,000 as of 2023. Under the chairmanship of George Lusk, residents established the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee. They offered a reward for the killer's capture, which the Metropolitan Police refused to do since it would lead to false and misleading information. The committee, by the way, hired two private investigators to also look into the case. Robert Anderson was appointed CID chief on September 1st, but left on medical leave to Switzerland on September 7th. On September 2nd, Superintendent Thomas Arnold, who was in charge of the EH division, went on leave as well. Anderson's absence confounded the overall direction of the investigation, prompting Chief Commissioner Sir Charles Warren to hire Chief Inspector Donald Swanson to coordinate the probe from Scotland Yard. On September 18th, a German hairdresser named Charles Ludwig was arrested on suspicion of the killings. However, he was released less than two weeks later when a double murder revealed that the actual perpetrator was still at large. Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes would be murdered by the Ripper in the same night. The death of prostitute Elizabeth Stride was discovered around 1 a.m. on Sunday, September 30th, in Detfield's yard within the gateway of 40 Burner Street, now named Henry K Street, Whitechapel. She lay in a pool of her blood, and her throat was slashed from the left to right, just like the last two victims. Moments before Louis Deemschutz discovered the bodies when Elizabeth was murdered, the only visible injury was her throat being slashed. He could have been very close to seeing Jack the Ripper, potentially stopping his reign of terror right there. Some writers on this case argue that Stride's murder was unrelated to the others because the body was unmutilated, and it was also the only murder to occur south of West Chapel Road and the blade used may have been shorter and of different design. Most experts, however, believe that the similarities in the case are unique enough to link Stride's murder to at least two of the earlier ones, as well as Catherine Eddow's murder on the same night. Later, at 1.45 a.m., Catherine Eddow's damaged body was discovered by Edward Watkins near the southwest corner of Mitre Square in the city of London, about 12-minute walk from Burner Street. She was killed less than 10 minutes before with a cut to the throat from left to right with a 6 inch long sharp pointed knife. Another close call for the Ripper. Her face and abdomen had been mangled and her intestines had been dragged out over her right shoulder, leaving a detached length between her chest and her left arm. Her left kidney and a large portion of her uterus were removed. Dr. Frederick Gordon Brown, the examining pathologist, believed that the culprit had considerable knowledge of the position of the organs and could infer from the position of the wounds on the body that the killer had knelt to the right of the body and worked alone. However, the first doctor on the scene, local physician Dr. George William Sequera, denied that the killer had any anatomical skill or was looking for any specific parts. The city medical officer, William Sedwick Saunders, who was also present for the autopsy, agreed. Because of the location of the murder, the City of London Police, led by Detective Inspector James McWilliam, were called in. 
A bloodstained portion of a doll's apron was discovered around 3 a.m. in a passageway from 108 to 119 Goulston Street, Whitechapel, roughly a third of a mile away from the murder scene. There was also chalk writing on a doorway wall that said the Jews are men that will not be blamed for nothing. At 5 a.m., Commissioner Warren arrived on the scene and ordered that the phrases be removed for the fear of inciting anti-Semitic violence. After, according to Middlesex coroner Wine Baxter, Elizabeth Stride was attacked rapidly and violently. She was discovered with a packet of cat chews in her left hand, indicating that she had not had the time to defend herself. Matthew Packer, a grocer, told Whitechapel Vigilance Committee private detectives that he had sold some grapes to Stride and a man shortly before the murder. Nevertheless, he had told police that he closed his shop without saying anything odd. Pathologists testified at the inquest that Stride neither had held, ingested, or consumed grapes. Her stomach contents were described as cheese, potato, and farinaceous powder. Nonetheless, Packer's story made the news. Packer's description of the man did not match that of any other witnesses who may have seen Stride with the man shortly before her death. All but two of the descriptions of the man differed. Joseph Londe, who walked through Mitri Square with two other men just before Adal's murder, may have seen her with a man, around 30 years old, who was shabbily clothed. He wore a peat cap and a fair mustache. Chief Inspector Swanson remarked that Londe's description matched a witness who may have seen stride with her murderer. Londe, on the other hand, indicated that he would not be able to identify the man again, and the two other men with him could not provide descriptions. A little progress was made in the investigation. Criticism of Metropolitan Police and Home Security Henry Matthews grew. The City of London Police and the Lord Mayor of London announced a £500 reward, which is about £59,000 in 2023, for information leading to the villain's capture. In the event of another attack, the use of bloodhounds to track the killer was considered, and a trial was held in London. The idea was scrapped, however. Because the scent trail became muddled in the city, the dogs had little experience in the urban setting, and the owner, Edwin Burrow of Wingate, near Scarborough, was concerned that the dogs would be poisoned by criminals if their role in the crime detection became known. On September 27th, the Central News Agency received a letter addressed to, quotation, Dear Boss, from the writer. He identified himself as Jack the Ripper, claiming responsibility for the murders. On October 1st, the agency received a postcard dubbed Saucy Jack and was signed as Jack the Ripper. On September 30th, it claimed responsibility for the most recent murders, referring to the killings of two women as the double event, a moniker that has stuck. On Tuesday, October 2nd, an unidentified female torso was discovered in the basement of New Scotland Yard, which was being renovated. The press instantly linked it to the Whitechapel murders. However, it was not included in the Whitechapel murders dossier, and any link between them is now questioned. The investigation was called the White Hall Mystery. On the same day, psychic Robert James Lees went to Scotland Yard and promised to use his psychic abilities to track out the murderer. The police turned him down and called him a fool and a lunatic. Anderson, the chief of CID, eventually returned from leave on October 6 and took over the investigation for Scotland Yard. On October 16th, George Lusk of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee received another letter purporting to be from the murderer. The handwriting style differed from the Dear Boss letter and the Saucy Jack postcard. The letter was accompanied by a little package containing half a human kidney preserved in alcohol. The letter's author stated that he retrieved it from a doll's body and fried it and ate the missing half. Opinions on whether the kidney and the letter were genuine were continued to be mixed. By the end of October, police had interrogated over 2,000 people, investigated upward of 300 people, and detained 80. And it was at this time we had another victim. Mary Jane Kelly, a prostitute, was murdered in her apartment at 13 Miller's Court, behind 26 Dorset Street in Spitafield. On Friday, November 9th, Chapman, one of the earlier victims, lived on Dorset Street as well, while Adal's was known to sleep there on occasion as well. Kelly's horrifically disfigured body was discovered on the bed just after 10.45 a.m. Dr. George Baxter Phillips was the first doctor on the scene. He saw that Kelly had her throat slashed and that was most likely what killed her. Her abdominal cavity was split open after death and her viscera were removed and spread over the room. Her breasts had been severed and her face had been damaged. Her thighs had been cut all the way down to the bone with even some muscle missing. Unlike the other victims, she was nude and wore a light chemise. Her garments were neatly put on a chair, except for some that had been burned in the grate. Aberlene suspected the murderer had torched the clothing to give light, 
as the room only was weakly lit by a solitary candle. Kelly's murder showed that the murderer's ability to conduct his atrocities in their own home rather than just on the street. Seems most likely he was pretending to solicit her for sex to get her alone in her home. Her being undressed and clothes folded have led to speculation that she undressed before lying in bed, implying that she was murdered by someone she knew, by someone she mistook for a customer, or while being asleep or intoxicated. On November 12th, the coroner of Northeast Middlesex, Dr. Robert McDonald, presided over Kelly's inquest at Shoreditch Town Hall. An enormous crowd of mourners attended Mary Kelly's funeral on November 19th amid scenes of intense sorrow. The streets grew congested and the cortege battled to make its way from Shoreditch Monastery to the Roman Catholic Cemetery in Leightonstone, where she had laid to rest. Charles Warren resigned as Metropolitan Police Commissioner on November 8th when the Home Secretary advised him that he could not make public statements without the Home Office consent. In December, Warren's replacement was James Monroe, who had quit a few months earlier due to disagreements with Warren. On November 10th, Police Surgeon Thomas Bond wrote to the head of the London CID, Robert Anderson, outlining the parallels between the five killings of Nichols, Chapman, Stride, Adals, and Kelly, which were undoubtedly committed by the same hand. On the same day, the cabinet decided to pardon any accomplice who provided information that led to the conviction of the actual perpetrator. Despite 143 extra plainclothes police officers deployed in Whitechapel in November and December, the Whitechapel murderer remained unidentified according to the Metropolitan Police Commissioner. It was this time again we had another victim. Victim number 8 was Rose Milet. On Thursday, December 20th, 1888, a patrolling policeman discovered the body of Rose Milet, a 26-year-old prostitute in Clark Shard off Popular High Street. Milet, whose birth name was Catherine Millet, was also known as Drunken Lizzie Davis, Fair Clara, Alice Downey, and Elizabeth Smith. Four doctors who examined Milet's body concluded that she had been murdered, while Robert Anderson believed that she had accidentally hung herself on the collar of her dress while drinking. Dr. Bond inspected Milet's body at Anderson's request and agreed with Anderson. Commissioner Monroe suspected a suicide or natural death as there was no traces of a struggle. According to the coroner, Wine Baxter, there is no evidence to show that this death resulted from violence. Nonetheless, the jury delivered a finding of willful murder against the unknown person or persons, and the case was added to the Whitechapel file. This leads us to our next victim. Alex McKenzie, a prostitute, was murdered in Castle Alley, Whitechapel, around 12.40 a.m. on Wednesday, July 17, 1889. Her left carotid artery was severed from the left to the right, as most of the other homicides, and she had cuts on her abdomen. However, her wounds were not as severe as in prior murders, and a shorter blade was employed. Commissioner Monroe and one of the pathologists examining the body, Dr. Bond, believed it was a ripper murder. However, other pathologists, Phillips, Robert Anderson and Inspector Aberlein disagreed. Later, writers were mixed, suggesting that McKenzie was a Ripper victim or an unknown murderer one to make it look like a Ripper homicide to divert attention away from himself. Coroner Baxter admitted both possibilities during the inquest, concluding, There is a remarkable similarity between this and the other class of cases that have happened in this neighborhood, and if the same person has not committed this crime, it is an imitation of the other issues and on September of 1889, we had another victim. Victim number 10 is known as the Pension Street Torso. On Tuesday, September 10th, 1889, around 5.15 a.m., a woman's torso was discovered under a railway overpass in Pension Street, Whitechapel. Extensive bruising on the victim's back, hip, and arm suggested that she had been severely battered shortly before her death, roughly one day before her corpse was discovered. Although the gendals had not been injured, the victim's abdomen had been badly disfigured in the style of Jack the Ripper. The fragment and body parts are thought to have been brought to the railway arc and buried beneath the old chemise. The victim was estimated to be between 30 and 40 years old. Despite having a thorough search, no more parts of her corpse were ever discovered, and neither the victim nor the perpetrator were identified. According to Chief Inspector Swanson and Commissioner Monroe, blood within the torso was suggested that the bleeding or a cut neck did not cause the death. This torso was thought to be Lydia Hartz, who had gone missing, according to newspaper speculation. It was dispelled after she had been seen in the hospital recovering from a bit of a spree. Another claim that the victim was a lost girl named Emily Barker, 
That was also debunked since the torso belonged to an older and taller lady. Swanson did not believe that this was a Jack the Ripper case, instead suggesting a connection to the Thames torso murders. Monroe shared Swanson's assessment. These three killings, as well as the Pynchon Street case, are thought to be the work of a serial killer known as the Torso Killer, who could be the same person as Jack the Ripper or a distinct criminal with unknown ties. Links have also been proposed between the three other murders, the Battersea Mystery of 1873 and 1874, where two women were found dismembered, and the 1884 Tottenham Court Road Mystery. Experts on the murders called informally Ripperologists like Stuart Evans, Keith Skinner, Martin Fidel, and Donald Rumbelow dismiss any link between the torso and the Ripper desk due to their different methods. Sir Edward Bradford took over as commissioner on June 21, 1890 after conflict with Home Secretary Henry Matthews about police pensions. Prostitute Frances Cole was murdered under a railway viaduct in Shallow Gardens, Whitechapel, on Friday, February 13, 1891. The final murder in the Whitechapel file. PC Ernest Thompson discovered her dead at 2.15 a.m., just moments after the attack, after hearing receding footsteps in the distance. Thompson remained at the scene as it is customary in the police force. Coles was found in a tunnel beneath the railway arc between Chamber and Royal Mint Street. When he found her, she was still alive but she died right before rescue arrived. Minor cuts on her head indicate that she was roughly pushed on the ground before her throat was slit at least twice, from the left to the right and back again. There was no other mutilations on the body, prompting some to conclude Thompson had upset the assailant. Superintendent Arnold and Inspector Reed arrived shortly after, coming from the neighboring Lehman Police Station. In contrast, Chief Inspectors Donald Swanson and Henry Moore, who had previously been involved in murder investigations, arrived around 5 a.m. The police apprehended and charged a man named James Sadler, who had previously been spotted with Coles. Swanson and Ward's inquiry of Sadler's past background and location at the time of the other Whitechapel murder suggested to the police that he could be the Ripper. Sadler, on the other hand, was released on March 3rd due to lack of evidence. The assailant or assailants were never identified and the crimes remain unsolved. There was an emergence of a body thought to be Lydia Hartz, the girl who had gone missing. According to newspapers, they believe Jack the Ripper was responsible for all, if not a majority, of the murders. It was fueled by sensational reporting and the mystery around the killer or killer's identity. Hundreds of books and articles have been written about the Whitechapel murders, and they have appeared in novels, short tales, comics, television shows, and films of many genres. The affluent society in London had long neglected the needy of the East End, but the nature of the Whitechapel murders and the victims' impoverished lifestyles drew national attention to their living situations. The murders galvanized public opinion against the East End's overcrowded, dirty slums, resulting in reform demands. In a letter to the Star newspaper on September 24, 1888, George Bernard Shaw remarked sarcastically on the media's apparent obsession with social justice. The press ate up the Jack the Ripper story. Instead of caring for those people's living situations, they only cared when it could be used for a story. George Shaw had a point. The media didn't care until it was too late. Parliamentary acts such as the Housing of Working Classes Act of 1890 and the Public Health Amendment Act of 1890 established minimum criteria for housing to revitalize blighted urban districts. Henry Matthews lost his job as Home Secretary in the 1892 general election after Frederick Aberlein retired. Donald Swanson and Robert Anderson retired after 1900, while Superintendent Robert Arnold retired the following year. There were no documents in the Whitechapel murders file after 1896. This concludes the tale of Jack the Ripper and the Whitechapel murders. But before we conclude this story, let's take a moment to reflect on what happened. From the beginning, we were on the quest for truth. Following the footsteps of Chief Inspector Swanson and the journalism of Emily Thompson, we've dissected the chilling crimes, examined evidence, and explored the theories that have sent chills down our spines. All of the Whitechapel murder victims were found to have resided in the Spitafields neighborhood, specifically in George Street, Dorset Street, Flower and Dean Street, and Thrall Street. Most victims had issues with alcoholism and lived as prostitutes. There were tons of changes in police authority throughout the years, making it hard to keep an investigation in one direction. People giving false accounts of seeing a man with the ladies or pretending that they were with them right before the murder slowed down investigations completely. Had they had our technology today, we shouldn't have been able to identify the Ripper or Rippers. 
It is a captivating yet tragic tale of a serial killer getting away. Who do you think Jack the Ripper is? Do you believe it was committed by one person or multiple assailants? Let us know in the comment section below. If you haven't already, it would mean so much if you hit that like and subscribe button as it helps us rank in the algorithm and we can have our videos seen by more people. We want to thank you for watching and we are excited to interact with you. If you have any video ideas, please let us know in the comment section below. We can't wait to see you in the next video.